Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacinta Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is Ghana land. We wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship that they have with their traditional land. So a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia. We're absolutely thrilled to be co-presenting this event tonight with the Australian Citizen Science Association in conjunction with the conference that is being held here at UniSA and um, a very warm, extremely warm welcome to um, our delegates, the conference delegates, so I hope you're having a wonderful time. Tonight our speakers, Dr Karen Cooper from North Carolina State University and Amy Sterling from iWire will introduce us to the world of citizen science. A bit of background on the Hawke Centre. We are a centre that is committed to delivering a free and diverse program of events and exhibitions throughout the year which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. The session tonight is being recorded and a podcast will be available on the Hawke Centre website next week. So, as we are recording, can I please ask that you switch your phones to silent? But for those of you who'd love to do this, feel, please feel free to join the Twitter conversation using the link on the screen behind me. So, oh, before I forget, we are having a reception after the lecture in our gallery space, the Kerry Packer Civic Gallery, which is just through that doorway up there. So for those of you who would like to come and join us, um, we have a little bit of food and some drinks, so please feel free to join us. So it is now my pleasure to welcome our MC for this evening, award-winning journalist with the ABC, Miss Jessica Harmson. So I'm going to now hand over to Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Good evening and welcome to the Australian Citizen Science Association's public lecture. Tonight, of course, wouldn't be possible without our sponsor, the South Australian Government and support of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. As already mentioned, we're going to hear from three incredible speakers of diverse backgrounds and unparalleled experience in science. We'll hear addresses from Dr Karen Cooper of North Carolina State University, followed by Amy Robinson-Sterling from iWire. Then Michelle Neal from the Australian Citizen Science Association and an avid citizen scientist herself is going to join us on stage at the end for Q&A. This is where you, the audience, has the chance to ask your own questions of these amazing women. So get your thinking caps on. But before we get to the speakers, we have the honour tonight of hearing from the Chief Scientist from South Australia, Dr Leanna Reid. Please make her feel welcome. Thank you, Jessica, and uh, may I also acknowledge that we are on the land of the Ghana people and respect uh, their uh, traditions, uh, past and present. We had a, a wonderful um, uh, introduction yesterday by Uncle Lewis. I'm not sure if any of you have heard him speak before, a, a wonderful, very witty uh, Aboriginal elder. Uh, so it was, it's always good to hear him. And he says something different every time I've heard him. So uh, he talked yesterday about um, the fact of, of what Aboriginal people have and the sense of observation powers and the way that they integrate that knowledge. And it's, uh, it's part of citizen science we could learn a lot from. Um, may I also welcome particularly our, our guest speakers and international guests from the conference here. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful conference to have. It's the second Australian conference, which we have international conference, holding this in Adelaide, uh, a great uh, uh, venue for it, and I think a very successful conference. You're going to hear some very interesting insights, I think, and overviews of the power of citizen science. And these public lectures will give you that insight, I think, into uh, a, a real broad range in its potential future. But the broader context of the conference has brought together a whole range of experts uh, with, and citizens with a passion for science, which is very important. 
We as citizens already participate in a, unknowingly, in many cases, in a vast number uh, of research efforts. I mean, you just think when you, uh, how Google, Amazon, Facebook accumulate data. Uh, how do you know, how does your phone, Google phone, know where you are in a restaurant, uh, what the traffic conditions are that you're driving along in? They're accessing data continuously from your mobile phone. I guess it's a form of citizen science participation, whether you like it or not. Uh, and the participation of very large numbers of people is fundamental to that kind of uh, initiative. But whether or not you like that, it is actually extremely important and an opportunity that we need to take much more advantage of in terms of scientific analyses. In my own field, for example, which is the biomedical space, we have long suffered from a lack of capacity to access health data from, from people that can drive our understanding of what new treatments and so forth could be. In uh, Scotland, for example, they have uh, an opt-out system, we have an opt-in system, for use of medical data, de-identified and so forth, so that you can't get your personal information. But you can go back over health uh, results um, for a very, very long period. And when, as a scientist, if you're trying to say, I want to evaluate procedure A and B, how can I do that? If you haven't got that kind of data, you're forced in doing a clinical trial, for example, which is expensive, it takes a long time. If you've got all that data availability, because in a way citizens are participating and they've opted in to do it, uh, you can just basically access that and almost have the instant answers. We're starting to get there, um, and our uh, wonderful cheese grater, which we have uh, uh, in this, uh, on North Terrace here, is in fact doing a lot of that analysis as we speak for South Australian data and we're the first in the country to be doing this. But citizen science also, from the point of view of the government, I'm here tonight uh, representing Minister Ma, the uh, Minister for Information, uh, Science and Technology. Uh, it also brings together two very important priorities for this state government, indeed the whole state. One is making sure that citizens have a strong role in policy and decision making by government and the other is using science and technology and the increased need for that to drive the economic development of this state. So examples of, the, of how the government has involved citizens, we've had a number of citizens' juries. Uh, we may not always like the outcome from them, but uh, they are bringing people in. We had one, if you remember, on the Nuclear Royal Commission. That ended up uh, um, meaning we didn't go ahead with it. Um, People thought, oh, the, the Premier was just going to have this and it would go on. But no, he took the advice of that and we, do, we don't have it, whether you agree with that or not. The other one I think that I really enjoy is Open State. I, those of you who participated in Open State recently, where a whole lot of initiatives, ideas, some themes that are really big themes for um, not just the state, the country, the world, and citizens coming together, participating in, in various forums. I was involved in one, for example, on artificial intelligence and getting the people's views on that and their fears and reactions and so forth. And in terms of science and technology, I think a classic example of that, of the effort the government has put into that recently, is this North Terrace Biomedical Precinct. Uh, new hospital, of course, but SAMRI, our Medical Research Institute. If you haven't had a chance to tour through that, I recommend you do. It is, it is a really iconic building. In fact, when it was first going to be built, the architects came up with some design and the chairman, Raymond Spencer, uh, said to them, well, uh, the bad news is you're fired. I don't want a box. Uh, but he said, but the good news is if you can come up with something imaginative, we'll rehire you. And, and that's how we got the iconic uh, Samri building. And now, of course, that's led to the whole expansion of this biomedical precinct. Uh, University of Australia has moved all of its medical research and medical school here. University of South Australia uh, is doing similarly with its new cancer research institute. There will be a SAMRI 2 on site very soon. A new women's and children's hospital is planned. So it really has becoming a powerhouse, one of those precincts that's probably uh, getting towards being rivaled in the southern hemisphere. Space technologies, we had that wonderful congress in Adelaide recently. It has put South Australia very much on the map. And I would be very confident in predicting that the Prime Minister would not have announced that we will have a national space agency if we didn't have that international conference uh, held here. 
uh, renewable energies, um, yeah, with, with a canary in the mind to some extent, but we're also learning to cope with that and learning the lessons that you need uh, reliable base power as well. Uh, when we've learnt that, we, it's going to put us in a very strong position. And finally, I guess gig city, uh, if you've heard that term, seen it on buses around, uh, it refers to the speed of internet, a, a gigabit speed internet, which is 100 times the average in Australia and about 10 times that that, that the uh, NBN is going to deliver. Now that's going to be throughout Adelaide, um, is in the process of being rolled out. So that really puts our companies and our research organisations ahead of the pack in some of these things like citizen science, which are very uh, information intensive. So that's a snapshot, I think, of why, uh, to, I think, to, to illustrate the importance of this area of citizen science to, to South Australia and indeed the world. The other aspect I'd say is that science is no longer an individual effort. It used to be. It used to be, you know, back when I started doing research, you'd have your lab coat on and you and a couple of other people in the lab. That doesn't work anymore. It's large collaborative efforts. You think of the mapping of a genome and how many people had to contribute to that and what we've done since to bring down the price of that to about you know, $1,000 to map your genome if you so choose to do it. Um, the other aspect about uh, the fact that science is not in isolation, the other uh, real positive about citizen science is that it will help build trust in science and, edu and interest in education that will lead to more people coming into STEM subjects. Uh, trust is a, an important issue for science. It goes both ways. Scientists perhaps think that, oh, citizens, they don't know anything. They can't really help us. Conversely, there's a lot of people who don't trust science. Part of this, we don't trust big institutions and so forth now. I trust what I read on Twitter more than I believe from a, a scientific paper. The more that citizens are involved in science, the more they're going to feel comfortable, because you're always comfortable with things you know, and the more perhaps we'll encourage your children to take up those science, STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths subjects at school because we desperately need them. In the IT area, for example, only 3% of 15-year-olds say that they are heading for a career in the information technology space. And when you look at the challenges we've got in things like cyber security, it's just crazy. The job opportunities are huge. Somehow that's not getting through. Citizen science will help us do that. So finally, let me leave you with some sagely advice that was given to us by our federal chief scientist, Alan Finkel, uh, yesterday. Alan uh, is a wonderful chief scientist. He gives the most uh, magnificent uh, talks, um, and yesterday's was no exception. He, he would, they would be online if you want to go on and read his various talks he gives around the place. And he's, his, in his view, a great citizen science project must meet three criteria. It has to be good science. We don't want people going in and doing stuff that's not quality science. And the second is that citizen science has to be a door to the world of science. It has to really let people in and participate properly, not, not in some pseudo way. And finally, it has to make the world a better place. Uh, and I think that is a name that we have in science generally. Uh, it doesn't always work out that way as its outcome, but I think that the intention of it is there and it's very important for citizens to help drive that along. So I think those messages are pretty important. It has to be good science, has to open a door to the world of science, to the citizens, and has to make the world a better place. And I hope that's a good introduction to what you're going to hear about uh, uh, the value of citizen science. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reid, and thank you for your indeed your support and contribution to uh, tonight's public lecture and the conference as a whole. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker tonight, Dr. Karen Cooper. Please join me in making her feel welcome. Hi, everyone. Is this, okay, it's all good. <laughs> well, it's really great to see everyone here this evening. Um, so citizen science um, really rep is a term that represents a, a very varied array of ways that scientists and the public collaborate to develop a shared understanding of the world. And um, what I'm going to do is basically go through a few examples, really just to illustrate that it isn't just one way that that collab collaboration happens, but there's multiple ways and forms and um, activities that are involved in that. But what I hope that you'll see through these different examples 
is really two things. <clears throat> and one is that citizen science is real science, right? That it leads to real discoveries. And what's really interesting there is that it's discoveries that would not be possible by conventional science, right? So citizen science isn't redundant with conventional science. It actually allows us to extend the research frontiers and accomplish things that scientists couldn't accomplish if they were just working alone. And then the other is, is that because it involves the public and scientists working together, there's really a development of social capital. And that's the networks and connections that people make, the learning that happens that really just helps us solve problems better together. And so when we get new knowledge, we get social capital, we really get um, a sustainable world, we get better natural resource management, we get social climate justice kind of things. Um, anyway, so I hope that citizen science will help you think differently about who can make knowledge, about where that happens, about who it serves, and a whole host of questions really about our knowledge production systems and how we answer those questions really helps us figure out how we're going to solve problems together. I guess before I go into detail on citizen science, I was just going to mention that my entry into the world of citizen science actually began, that journey began here in Australia over 20 years ago, because I uh, did my PhD research in Armidale, New South Wales, and studying brown tree creepers. Are there any bird watchers out there? Yeah, a few? Okay, good. So. Uh, and actually, I came here uh, with my husband, who was an astronomer, and he wasn't really that into birds until we got to Australia, and there's all these beautiful, totally colorful birds, and he kept saying, is that one yours? Is that one yours? Is that one yours? And I was like, well, it's that little brown one on the ground. Uh, so anyway, but uh, it's got a good personality of a bird. <laughs> anyway, but, and so I was super happy doing field work, um, but then uh, just before my last field season, actually, we started a family. Uh, and then fieldwork wasn't quite so attractive to me anymore. And uh, as soon as I got my degree, there was a job at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, which is a sort of a mecca for citizen science with birds. And the job was basically come and do research using data that everyone else in the country has collected. <laughs> and I was like, okay, no more field work for me. So at first it was like very selfish motivations. Um, but then I really grew to appreciate uh, citizen scientists and the power of the whole process and really drew a lot of hope and inspiration from that and um, as my children grew uh, and now they're young adults but I'm continuing uh, you know with citizen science anyway so I want to start with a first example from uh, it with birds a very iconic project in citizen science called eBird um, which is in every country but it's based in the US and this map just shows uh, the seasonal movements of this uh, uh, Savannah Sparrow, I think it is, um, over the course of a year. And it's more up to date than you'd find in any field guide. And it's really created from uh, millions of observations that go into eBird from tens of thousands of bird watchers. And it's used by scientists. There's hundreds of publications and new, of new findings about birds that have come from eBird. It's used by uh, land managers, often sometimes real, almost real-time data. For example, in the um, Central Valley of California, they look at real-time data to decide, uh, the Nature Conservancy does this, to decide exactly which farmers, rice farmers, to pay to flood their properties when they know that shorebirds are coming through that spot. Um, and then it's used by bird watchers. Uh, to know where to go birding, right? Where are the hot spots, where they're going to see. So there's all these different stakeholders that are served by people pooling together that information and then having it served out in ways that's super accessible. Um, anyway, but I'd like to dispel a couple of myths that sometimes happen with citizen science, because a lot of times people think about it, oh, it's all volunteer-based, so therefore it must be free. <laughs> and as a friend of mine says, well, it's free as in puppies, right? So you can be given a puppy for free, but then you need to take care of it, right? And you've got to pay the vet bills and buy food and love it and, you know, care for it and all those kinds of things. And it's the same with the Citizen Science Project. Sure, people are donating their sweat and energy and time, um, but there's, there's really uh, keeping up all that volunteer management. And then the cyber infrastructure to make data like this accessible to all those stakeholders is actually also a huge uh, investment. Um, it's still economical for the, I mean, the bang for the buck, but it's not free. 
And another myth that I encounter sometimes is that people think that this is only possible because we have smartphones and the internet, which certainly makes it way easier and faster, but this exact type of citizen science happened in the early 1800s. And this is a chart, and it's not all pretty and animated, obviously, but it's a chart of the exact same kind of data, but of whales. It's the seasonal movements of right whales and sperm whales over the course of a year that's crowdsourced from ship observations. And each of these is broken up into little quadrants, and it's presence absence data, just like eBird. Um, and that was um, organized by Matthew Mowry, who was in the Navy at the time in the US. And uh, it's actually, this is mentioned as a footnote in uh, the book Moby Dick. Um, but anyway, but what Maori is most known for is uh, similar work, but with um, having sailors submit data on specialized logbooks related to wind and currents. And he had uh, sailors in 13 different countries contributing that information from across all the, ocean, you know, the seven seas, and uh, bringing that together into these charts, updating them periodically, made sailing safer and faster for everyone, right? So pooling all that together and everyone benefited. Um, so he's considered the father of oceanography. As one sailor wrote, Unt uh, until I took up your work, I had been traversing the ocean blindfolded. And I think that just really gets at the heart of scientific discovery, right? Because I like to distinguish it from inventions. It's not like we're creating something when we discover it. We're actually, it's already there. We're just finally revealing it, right, and uncovering it and removing blindfolds. Um, and that's what we do with citizen science. So I was curious how many people here do citizen science, if I can see a show of hands. How many already do it? Oh, that's great. So most people already do. Awesome. So uh, yeah, because sometimes when I speak to groups, I, I ask, well, how many people who aren't professional athletes play sports? Well, you can give me a show of hands. How many people play sports but are not professionals? Yeah, quite a few. OK, and how many people do who aren't professional musicians or artists do some kind of art or music? Yeah, lots of people. OK, or how many people who aren't professional well, I don't know what that would be, but do sort of some kind of civic engagement. Yeah, okay. So there's tons of er things that we pursue that are not related to our career, that we pursue because they are fun, because they're healthy, because they enrich our lives in some way. And those are often really obvious in some areas, but not for many people, it's not obvious in science. We think of it as only a profession, but it's more than that, of course. And even Einstein said, Science is a wonderful thing, especially if one doesn't have to earn one's living at it. <laughs> so citizen science is really where it's at. It's like the best of all worlds. Anyway, and so it often draws people in for just basic curiosity, and then sometimes just for like environmental concerns, right? And this, that photo there is from the, the fires that actually we were experiencing in California. And suddenly our listservs were going crazy. How do I measure air quality? Because <laughs> it was bad for so many people. Um, anyway, and so now citizen science has really blossomed in so many disciplines. Like really, in almost every discipline I look at, there is some, some research that's being advanced by citizen science. And what that means, you know, for people who are interested in science, it means that almost anything you're interested in, there's a scientist that really wants to know what you're seeing, what you're observing, and have your help in some way. Um, anyway, and so there's, what I like to emphasize a little bit is just that there's a lot of things that we know from citizen science. Like I said, it's real science. And how do we know, for example, that birds are breeding earlier? Um, how do we know the climate is changing? Right, where does the long-term weather data come from? comes from farmers. <laughs> um, that monarch butterflies migrate to Mexico, or that an invasive mosquito species has arrived in Germany. That extracts from periwinkle can treat diabetes, or this, <laughs> we'll learn about the selectivity of retinal neurons. The impact of invasive ladybirds in, in uh, England, or that endangered monk seals are attempting to recolonize the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Or that right now there's about 50 types of bacteria that live in your belly button. And often when we think about any scientific discovery, we think, oh, that's because of scientists. But I just like to emphasize that there's many ways of knowing other than conventional science. Because another way is, of course, indigenous knowledge. And one of those examples is actually indigenous knowledge. Does anyone want to guess which one? Periwinkle, yeah, exactly. And that was something that Eli Lilly, the pharmaceuticals, took 
and uh, it was a it resulted in a lot of lawsuits um, and, and ultimately resulted in the um, International Treaty on Biological Diversity. And all the other examples are things that we know a lot about thanks to citizen science, although it doesn't always go by that name. And it's a relatively new name, and it's kind of this umbrella term. And in different disciplines and whatnot, it's called lots of different things, lots of different acronyms. Um, but now it's kind of all coming together under this umbrella term of citizen science. And it's not just new scientific discoveries. It also leads to a lot of conservation, uh, biological conservation uh, outcomes. And so here's a little quiz. There's a lot of birders in the audience. So who can tell me which one of these does not belong with the others? There's a few different ways you can select. Sorry for the northern hemisphere bias a little bit, although there's at least one southern hemisphere bird there. <laughs> I can say, so there's the laughing owl. There's Carolina parakeets, great auk, uh, passenger pigeon, dusky seaside sparrow, and the eastern bluebird. Any guesses? Which one's different from all the others? So here is extinct, right? Any other guesses? No? It's a tough one, I guess, here. <laughs> so it's the eastern bluebird, F. <laughs> oh, did you get it? So, and the difference is, is that actually they're all extinct, except for the eastern bluebird. And why? Because there's, there was bird watchers, there's a whole, who basically are huge fans of eastern, of bluebirds, and have gone to extensive, extensive um, lengths to make sure, and ensure their survival. They're a, they're a what do you call it here, a, a whole nesting species, right? And so they needed nest boxes and all that kind of stuff. And so it really, and, and monitoring of those nest boxes, management of those nest boxes, most of, a huge part of my research actually comes from the bluebird enthusiasts who have really brought bluebird populations up to a super high level and collect data monitoring those. Um, and there's people who are interested in all kinds of things, right? So there's people who are enthusiastic about birds, people who are enthusiastic about uh, fungi. So this is an Australian project. Fun have people who, anybody heard of fungi map? Yeah? So, uh, great. Um, uh, you know, and it takes certain specialties, but there's, uh, people learn that kind of natural history. Um, there's uh, another citizen science project I learned about while I was here. Uh, Echidna CSI. How many people have heard of that one? It's relatively new. Oh, great. And, uh, and with it, you can, um, it's an app, there's an app, and you can record, uh, take a photo and record an echidna sighting. Or maybe you don't see the species, but you can collect a specimen. That's a polite way of saying, pick up the poop, and, or, or, yeah, and send it to the lab. Um, anyway, and lots of cool science coming out of that. There's um, a lot of citizen science in astronomy, and this uh, Jenny McCormick is a New Zealander who has more publications than me. She's contributed so much to astronomy. She's even had a paper in Nature, which you may know is like, like the top journal ever. And um, she's part of these international collaborations, really, that are finding new planets. You know, it's just so rainy and wet in New Zealand that they haven't really invested heavily in professional astronomy, but there's so much astronomy that requires, uh, like, sort of passing the baton and observing continuously as the Earth is rotating. And so um, the amateur, they're called, amateur astronomers, especially in New Zealand, are relied upon heavily for so many key discoveries. Um, and it's not just, you know, so she's invested lots, obviously, in her own telescope, um, but there's a lot of... And I, I just like that picture of her <laughs> that I found on the internet. Um, she's pretty tough. And, uh, um, but there's other astronomy, citizen science, there's a whole slew of it that is online only. So you can participate entirely from your computer and the comfort of your armchair, um, like Galaxy Zoo, which was um, photographs that were created from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So it was all these remotely taken photographs. And people wanted to know about the galaxies and whether they were clockwise or counterclockwise. And the computer algorithms can't do that, figure that out. They need a human eye, human mind, 
uh, to be able to know what that is. And they tried it with grad students first, chaining them to a desk for, you know, whatever, 80 hours a week. It really wasn't processing the data fast enough, so they released it online. And it's exciting because, you know, some people are the first to see that image. A lot of serendipitous discoveries happen from it. Anyway, needless to say, and tons of new um, papers and discoveries about uh, galaxies. Um, weather data, like I said, with climate change, a lot of our oldest ground-based data come from citizen scientists. Um, this fellow, Richard, um, what was his name, Hen Hendrickson, he started monitoring um, his weather station when he was 18. And in this photo, he's 101. Um, he passed away a year ago at 103. And um, yeah, so a lot of our long-term long data come from citizen science, and sometimes the same citizen scientist uh, who are super committed. And then I mentioned this is, was a classic discovery in the U.S. I know you have monarch butterflies here. The monarch butterflies in the U.S. are the only uh, migratory population, but people didn't know for decades. It was like this big mystery. Where do they go from the Midwestern U.S. and disappear every winter and then come back? And it was decades of volunteers, especially school teachers and their school kids, um, capturing monarch butterflies and putting little postage stamp kind of uh, things on their wings uh, for decades. And finally, in 1976, a, a tagged monarch was spotted in Mexico. And now we know that that is their migration route. Um, anyway, but it's, um, there's very varied types. I don't know if people have heard of distributed computing. Um, so right now, like the, big, the most powerful computers we have are not like a mainframe computer, but a whole network of distributed computing, computers. And you can have your computer or even your phone, anything that computes, um, when it goes into idle time, can be hooked up to such a network. And SETI at home, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, was one of the first distributed computing networks. Um, and there's particular hobbyists who participate in these. They're called overclockers. I don't know if anybody heard that term. There, there are people like this guy who like totally soup up their computer. They spend a fortune like getting like an enormous like CPU, GPU. They might use liquid nitrogen to super cool it. Um, and then they want to compete, right? It's like their drag race in a car they've souped up. They want to compete, so they go, they participate in these distributed computing networks. And some of the biggest computational problems are actually in the field of biochemistry related to protein folding. And it turns out there's a lot of diseases where the underlying cause is related to protein misfoldings. And, um, and it's a, a super computationally intensive problem to solve. And um, anyway, so a lot of the overclockers are in that. Not everybody can afford like a super expensive computer. Um, there's a lot of kids, younger kids, that contribute to distributed uh, computing as a group, and a lot of them are in fandom. Like, I don't know if you've heard of, like, like Trekkies, Whovians, like Doctor Who, Potterheads. Anyway, the one that is top of the charts in some of the biochemistry distributed computing actually started here in Australia um, with the Bronies. Have people heard of the Bronies? They, so they are uh, typically young guys, aged 14 to about 22. It's kind of geeky, which is why they formed a computing team. And they sincerely love My Little Pony, which is a show that was intended for little girls. But they love the animation, they love the music, the stories, everything. And so in a fandom, you know, they make fan art and fan fiction. And a lot of times they want to do good things and do good deeds. And so they volunteer, basically, their computing to citizen science. Anyway, and they are often top of the charts in one project that's called Rosetta at Home, which is about this protein folding. Um, and what's cool, what happened with Rosetta at home is when your computer goes idle and starts contributing power to this network, it was showing the protein, it's starting, trying to work out what the protein fold is. And people were watching their screen <laughs> saying, I think I could do that better. And so they told the head of that project and he said, okay, let's give it a try. And he collaborated with a game designer and they made a game called Fold It, which is, uh, people also work, tend to work in teams on this and, and try to figure out these protein folds. And people were right. They are better at it than the computer algorithms because people have creativity and imagination and um, anyway, and figure it out better, which has opened up a whole host of areas to go in terms of synthesizing new proteins, figuring out designs, lots of big insights. 
Anyway, there's other, I guess, sort of tamer <laughs> online citizen science, too, and this is Australian with Digival, which is um, digitizing and helping transcribe uh, documents that are in, or um, spec like, materials associated with specimens that are in the museums. And th these ones are uh, specimens in Australian museums. Have people heard of Digival? Yeah, some? Okay, just curious. You should check it out. Oh, and then I just wanted to mention there's sometimes other ways that people contribute to citizen science. It's not always uh, collecting data. This one started out that way. The Belly Button Biodiversity Project was at my institution. Um, and it, it, it's investigating the hygiene hypothesis, this idea that we maybe have more allergies and autoimmune problems because we're too clean, right, which is maybe making us destroy the microbiome. So it turns out there's bacteria like on every surface, on us, all that kind of stuff, and some of it might be really healthy. And so their project was starting to investigate that, and they chose to sample belly buttons because they thought that was like the area people washed the least. And so they... Um, had all these initial hypotheses about, they knew they would get a lot of diversity in microbes, and they were like, how are we gonna explain these? And they had all these hypotheses, and honestly, none of them, none of them could explain the Im overly immense diversity that they ended up finding. Um, we were really rooting for innies and outies, but nope, nothing, <laughs> nothing could explain it. And they finally, well, the only thing, when they started sampling surfaces, there was a difference um, with people who own dogs. So if you have a dog, your microbiome is slightly different than people that don't. And it's thought it might even be healthier. But anyway, it's still, still a early stages of research. Anyway, so they got frustrated and said, let's just ask other people. Like, we need more minds thinking about this. So they crowdsourced with the public for hypotheses. And people came up with, like, super interesting ideas to explain the variation. And that is guiding uh, the research that's continuing. Anyway, so I just wanted to emphasize that creating hypotheses is like a super fun part of science also, and that there's often times to participate in that way. Um, and then anyway, I just have a couple more examples. This one is from my home state of North Carolina. It's, um, we have a huge coast, but we only have two coastal biologists in the state, and they're responsible for managing this endangered sea turtle, <laughs> loggerhead sea turtles. Or yeah, it's a threatened species. Anyway, and so they have about 700 volunteers who make sure every segment of beach is covered every morning during sea turtle nesting season. And, um, and they, they're studying the population genetic structure as well, so when they find a nest, um, you know, they, they protect it, um, they take one egg to send off for analyses, um, sometimes they have to move nests if it might flood, um, or if there's too much light pollution, and then after it hatches, they count the eggs and tally up data like that. Anyway, very dedicated volunteers. That's like a regular citizen science project. But what happened here at Wrightsville Beach is that people were out there every day walking the beach. And if you've ever walked the beach in the morning, most beaches, I guarantee you, there's just a lot of trash. And that's what volunteers were seeing. And they're very, they're not bystanders, right? So they're starting to pick up the trash. And they're sitting around one day at a nest waiting to hatch. And they realize that they're all picking up the trash. And they say, you know what? Let's make our own citizen science project and tally and really keep track of how much garbage we're picking up from the beach. And so they come up with their own protocols and everyone reports back each day how many bags, standardized bags, they pick up and they tell this woman named Ginger. She compiles it each week. She starts sending it to the town board. The newspaper starts picking up that news. The response of the rest of the public? No. They were like, we don't believe you. And that's what happens a lot of times with citizen science. People hold it to like a certain higher standard. So they change their protocols. They used to pick up the trash and, you know, throw it away. But now they take it, they take everything back, they rinse it, they sort it, and they photograph it. And from that, so many things happen because that's how they realized that 90% of it was plastics. That's when they started raising awareness about plastics. They started, um, they started eliminating single-use plastics from their lives. They started campaigning and pressuring local businesses to stop using single-use plastics. They brought in Captain Charlie Moore, you know, who wrote about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, um, and really just raising awareness about plastics. Um, anyway, it's just like the amazing kind of uh, experiential learning that really leads to change. 
And then I just have one final one, which is, this was an example from Tonawanda, New York, of people that were in, it's called a fence line community, meaning that they, this neighborhood is bordered by lots of industry that's producing lots of different types of pollutants. And um, people were getting sick, a lot of bizarre illnesses. Anyway, with this bucket sampler, um, they collected an air sample. And it's really materials they could get at Home Depot or Walmart or whatever. Um, and they sent that sample off to the lab, incredibly high levels of benzene, which is very toxic. Um, and it led to further investigation that eventually led for the first time in US history to this guy getting convicted in criminal court and actually going to jail with a prison term for polluting. Right? It's always been the other way and up until then. People would go to jail for trying to stop pollution, <laughs> protesting it or whatever. And this time, and I think uh, that it's since those kinds of efforts have added citizen science and a data element to it, they are starting to succeed much more um, in winning those battles. Anyway, and so it's super exciting to see citizen science being organized globally with the Australian Citizen Science Association, which I'm so happy um, to come to the meeting that's here today, or that's been here this week. Anyway, I just want to end, I hope I'm not too over time, just with a little story of citizen science in cartoons. So uh, the following message will be told by stick people with the following disclaimer. Um, we do not only represent skinny people, <laughs> um, nor only white people, and nor only uh, bald people. <laughs> uh, we, uh, oh, unless otherwise noted to be a particular historic figure, which isn't in this. Um, we're generic stick people representing humans of every shape, age, ethnicity, race, and gender. Um, and we tell the story because at our core, we are all the same. Many people wonder where knowledge comes from. And in the status quo, scientists make knowledge inside this black box. And then science communicators translate and deliver the new knowledge into the everyday language of the stick people, the humans. So here a scientist comes out and says, here's new research on avian olfactory receptor gene repertoires, which is literally the title of a paper of a colleague of mine. Blah, blah, blah. Anybody know what that means? It means birds can smell. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, but with citizen science, we tear down the black box and we work together because we have a lot in common. Right? We all make observations. We are all curious. We can all experiment. We all think and wonder. We're all creative. We're all motivated for discovery. And we all enjoy doing things that often lend themselves to science. And we all like to know what, we all like to share what we know and what we see in some ways. And when we face big problems, just being handed scientific knowledge out of that black box really isn't enough. We need each other and that social capital to discover things otherwise not possible and to use that knowledge to find solutions. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Some fantastic examples in there. It's now my pleasure to introduce you all to Amy Robinson Sterling from iWire. Please make her feel welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there we go. Excellent. So hi, I'm Amy and uh, it is an honor to be here. It's my first time in Australia and I have to credit the crazy creatures of Australia for stemming my interest in biology. I used to grow up watching National Geographic Wild and all these weird marsupial tree bears and mammals that lay eggs made me ask so many questions about, you know, what we know and what we think we know and how many aspects of fact are broken by just going outside the norm that's outside your front door. Uh, so I'm here today to talk to you about a specific story in citizen science and how a population of gamers has transformed our neuroscience research. So I run a project called iWire out of Sebastian Sung's Computational Neuroscience Lab at Princeton University. Uh, and we are trying to map the brain. It's really my greatest passion in life. I'm so curious about how we are who we are. So before we start on this journey into citizen science, I hope you guys will just enjoy pondering for a moment like how awesome the brain really is. 
You know, it allows you to do complicated tasks. Maybe that's not that complicated to peel an apple, but doing pretty complicated motor activities or even simpler things like walking or being able to sit in your chair and not fall over. This is pretty difficult to do for robotics, but for the brain, you don't even have to think about walking once you learn how to do it. It allows you to dream and to imagine, to find things cute, slightly goofy. You know, everything around us, really everything that we understand about our own selves is thanks to the brain. And of course they don't work in isolation. It's amazing that there are seven billion people on this planet, all thinking, feeling individuals, and the society and culture and government, as well as you know, science and technology, is this beautiful output of neurons, of this seemingly small little organ, which I recently learned is about the same size as a platypus. <laughs> so the brain is made up of lots of neurons that are all connected together. And if you, they're not all connected, but lots are connected. If you zoom really far in to cerebral cortex, it's kind of like the crust on the earth or bark on the outside of the tree, you will find that there are lots of different types of neurons. They come in many different shapes and many different sizes. If you keep zooming in, you'll eventually get to the scale that we operate, which is what we're trying to find is synapses. So in the brain, there's something like 100 trillion synapses. And the realm that we're trying to explore is called connectomics. So if you were to try to map all the synapses in your brain at this point in time, you would have a snapshot of you, and it would be unique to you. It'd be sort of a, a neuro selfie. And what we're trying to do is map out neurons at such high resolution so that you can find the synaptic connections between specific circuits. And you pair that connection with the functional activity, and that allows you to understand how the brain does what it does. So this is one non-artistic interpretation of a single synapse that was reconstructed by our gamers in Nywire. Now, the way that we reconstruct synapses is we take a small volume of brain and you use an electron microscope to image slice by slice by slice, as this animation will show. That gives you a volume of tissue, and then you can sort of trace inside the lines in order to reconstruct 3D neurons that have grown through that volume. So here you're, show, you're seeing an animation of a circuit that we published in the journal Nature. Uh, and this is a circuit found in the retina, in the back of the eye, that plays a role in a mammal's ability to tell if something is moving left or right. Now that may seem super basic compared to what the brain can do. And it is, but that's cutting edge in this field. That's why we have to go faster and farther. Now, why are we only studying these simple, super basic uh, synaptic circuits in the brain? Well, because it's extremely time-consuming to map neurons. The technology to see them at this resolution is pretty new, and even today, with the best technology and really the best AI in the world, uh, it, it takes an exorbitant amount of time. So for context, before we launched this project, iWire, it took about 1,000 hours of expert human time to map one neuron. 80 billion neurons in one brain. Right? So you're probably like, what? <laughs> oh my god, that's not scalable. And it's absolutely not scalable. So we started thinking outside the box, like outside our world of science, because there's not enough neuroscientists in the world to even begin to tackle this problem. So we drew inspiration from the world of games. There are, you know, a number of different figures that are floating out on the internet, but one from a TED Talk says that there's roughly a billion gamers on this planet. There's lots of people who are spending oh, countless hours every day going on missions and solving puzzles just for the sheer joy of doing it. And so, with this in mind, we embarked on this journey to turn our lab software into an online puzzle game. We launched it five years ago, 
And now we have a quarter million people who have signed up, and they come from 150 different countries. And now I'm going to try to show you guys a live demo. We're going to together as a room map a little bit of a neuron, uh, and then I'll come back to my presentation and give you guys some thoughts on how I think this is hopefully going to transform even more, uh, even more realms of citizen science. So. So this right here, this is iWire. And this thing that I'm rotating around is a real neuron that is actively being reconstructed minute by minute by the gamers who are in iWire. So I should say that most of our participants are in the United States and uh, Europe. So it's like the lowest time of day. But I'll see if there's anyone online. So hey, guys. Hey, everyone. So there's 42 people online right now. I don't know if everyone feels like chatting. Uh, <laughs> doing a live demo in Adelaide at what is citizen science? Smiley face. OK. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe someone will say, hey. If not, it's OK. So this, this thing right here, this is the soma. And then all these little branches that are coming out, these are the dendrites, kind of the processes that extend from the neurons. And over here, we have our leaderboard. So these are the people who've scored points in iWire this week. There's, there's a lot of participants. Uh, and there, there's lots of game mechanics. So you have your profile, and you can see all your stats and accuracy. But I'm going to go in and start playing. So what you see right here, this cube, it's a small volume of brain. It's four and a half microns on each side, which is itty bitty. <laughs> and over here, this is an electron microscope image. It's ultra high resolution. 16 nanometers is one pixel. And as I scroll through, you see it's scrolling through a plane on this cube. And you see there's all these sort of like oval looking things. You sort of see that. So as these neurons Imagine like my arm is a neuron. And if you're taking cross-sectional images where the outside of my arm is stained dark gray and the inside is light gray, it would look sort of like ovals, kind of like a tree branch. And this blue thing here is a piece of a branch of one neuron. And other players have mapped, a, have mapped the branch to kind of come up somehow from this direction because it enters the cube here. And what we're going to try to do is map this branch to the other side of the cube. Now, you may be like, well, how are you going to do this? So you see this part where, where it's really flat, it's sharp, just kind of cut off? That means that something is missing. So if I go, if I go over here, this blue piece is the, you know, again, it's the cross-section that, uh, that corresponds to the, the segment of the neuron. So if I scroll through, you see how there's kind of a, a line here if I'm hiding the coloring? If I click to kind of color in the rest of this, it's adding all these little blue pieces over here. So an interesting part of this is that when you click to color in 2D, it adds a big chunk in 3D. So iWire is a combination of human insight and machine learning. So we use AI to semi-automate this process, which is why anywhere that I click, it adds a little 3D thing. And that has dropped down the amount of time that it takes to map neurons by a couple of orders of magnitude. Um, so this is a little bit of an odd shape, but it's a good example of why this is not super easy for a machine to do. So I'm just going to keep scrolling through here. And, and by the way, this is like the easiest cell that we have. The, the neurons, they get really narrow, and then they bulge out into synapses, and they get really narrow again. So I'm just going to scroll all the way through this cube. And what we're, what we're trying to do is make sure that there's nothing missing and no jagged edges. So like right here, for example, where there's like a chunk kind of missing. That says that we didn't, we didn't get everything. But we'll see if this looks right. So what you're, um, it's, a little, it's a little difficult to explain because it's based on knowing what looks right which is not easy to teach machines. So our gamers come in, and what they're looking for is smooth edges. Neurons are biological. If there's anything jagged or sharp, that means that something's missing or something is not right. So even though this 
may look like a very odd process coming out of this neuron. If you look at the 3D model here, it's actually pretty smooth and contiguous with the rest of the branch. So that means that that piece is correct to be added in. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go through here really quickly. All right, so we're scrolling, scrolling. Looks like we haven't. There's nothing really missing through here. So we got this branch to the other side of the cube, this little gnarly kind of thing. So what's going to happen when I hit Submit is it's going to cross-reference what I played with what other people played. So in this case, I was a trailblazer, which means I was the very first person to do this cube. So the game will assign other players, three other players, to do this cube after me. And they will see real-time updates uh, in this little thing which is called the activity tracker that compares their accuracy and we are tracking in real time also the, the agreement, the consensus of all the players who have done every cube in the history in the game and so the players who are really good we can give them a higher vote when they submit the cubes versus the players who aren't very good they have to keep playing until they become good so that they don't throw in the science. Um, and we have a number of different ranks of players in here who come in and check the overview of the neuron, um, make sure that nothing is missing, and they alert our game masters who are our expert neuron tracers within the lab if something needs attention. So just a quick snapshot of this game iWire. And I'm going to go back to my slides here. Cool. So, you know, the whole history of science. Um, I gotta move that mouse, man. <laughs> the whole history of science is characterized by exclusivity. You know, early scientists were aristocrats. In the 1700s, they called them experimental gentlemen because they were noblemen who paid for missions and took, put, took you know, natural philosophers with them. And in fact, uh, it sucks. Well, you could just look at these neuron branches. <laughs> in fact, you know, the word scientist didn't even emerge until the year 1834. It's super new. And even in the hundred or, you know, a little over, almost 200 years now that have come, it's remained pretty exclusive. You know, science has been behind lab doors, reserved for people with a PhD, graduate students, or, you know, undergrads who needed a little bit of extra money while they're getting a degree. And now, thanks to citizen science, anyone, anywhere can participate. And projects like, like Karen talked about, and projects like iWire, and forthcoming games, and especially where we're pairing human insight with AI, it's allowing science to move faster and farther. You know, in the field of neuroscience, the types of questions that really inspire me are not just how a mammal can tell that something is moving left or right. It's how do we feel when we have a connection with someone? You know, what is willpower or the lack thereof? And ultimately, I hope that we can get closer to understanding how these 80 billion neurons in a brain create a thinking, feeling human being. And it is my opinion that in order to tackle these monumental questions that have risen in humans' minds ever since we were able to call ourselves humans, in order to tackle those, we need more than the traditional scientists. We need citizen scientists. We need people from diverse backgrounds from all over the world to bring their own perspectives and their unique skill sets and their wonderful questions so that science becomes something that's for everyone. So I'll just end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. I don't know about you, but my mind's been blown by that, particularly that gaming example. How extraordinary. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite um, both Karen and Amy back up to the stage to take their seats and for Michelle to join us up as well from the Australian Citizen Science Association. And it's your turn now to ask these <laughs> informed ladies some of your own questions that you might have about citizen science. Is there anyone from the floor who'd like to kick us off with the first question this evening? We do have some microphones that will be roving around the room. 
It's a great opportunity to take advantage of the knowledge that these women have between them. No? Well, I might start off the question oh, then. There's one up there. Oh, we do have one? What up the back? I think we're all right, right up the very back of the room. Hello? <laughs> I don't know if this is the best question to start off with. Um, a very common question when you're working in citizen science, as you will know, is from scientists who say, a citizen can't do nearly as well as I can. And they also say, this will mean the loss of my job. I think the two are somewhat conflicting. But um, I presume that you've answered this question a great many times. And I'd love to know what you both say when you get that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do hear that a lot. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't even know where to begin. So, uh, there's a lot of questions about data quality with citizen scientists. Is this, is there I a think feedback? It's theory. Um, well, so for one, I like to emphasize, like I did earlier, that it's not redundant, that it's not the same as what a professional would collect anyway. It's like a whole different ball game. Um, there's, like dozens of ways that we deal with data quality issues in citizen science. Um, but anyway, but I also often point out that actually the citizen scientists that I know and that are in so many projects are way uh, more dedicated and better than the undergraduate interns when I hire them to collect field data. <laughs> so, because I mean, because people are doing it out of their own uh, volition, like out of their own curiosity and their own drive, and they're like totally dedicated. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess I maybe don't have the best answer for it, but but I do know that there there is a lot, often a lot of skepticism among scientists, and it just takes a while to persuade them that they're. I mean, we're not just overlooking all these data quality concerns. It's just that there's ways that we design projects to take care of that. There's, like with online projects like Galaxy Zoo, it's not that one person classifies each photo. 20 people do it, and there's a consensus tool behind the scenes. And if 20 people agree that it's counterclockwise, it's pretty safe to say it's counterclockwise. You know, and like all projects have like some stopgap measures and like ways of handling those issues. Um, yeah. And then as to putting people out of a job, no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we have like the opposite, actually. There's so many researchers that want to use the iWire platform to map their neurons because it's a huge hindrance, right? I mean, it takes a lot of time and effort to generate these data sets, and now it, it's... Like, we can crowdsource the reconstructions, which is the huge bottleneck. I mean, it, it's a huge benefit to the neuroscience community to be able to engage these players, and they are so engaged. Like, some of the uh, images that I showed in my slides were created by our players. We have developers who are building plugins. I mean, it just helps. Like, scientists always want more help. I mean, like, like we yeah. never have enough people <laughs> and enough budget. So it, it's really good. You know, it's like the catch-22 of the modern era is that we can gather way more data than we have automated pipelines to process. So mm -hmm. citizen science is tackling that, thankfully. It's a great question. We actually have a similar scenario happening in journalism at the moment yeah. with a new branch contributing mm -hmm. to our industry as well. So mm -hmm. um, indeed, can I actually get each of you, actually, Karen, you've already sort of briefly touched on this in your address, but Amy, could I get you to talk about how you got into citizen science? Sure. So uh, I am not a scientist by training. I studied electrical engineering, uh, but I met Sebastian Sung, who had this who started iWire, actually I met him at a TED conference because I've been involved with TED for a long time and I got interested in TEDx as a model for crowdsourcing. But I, before iWire, was the creative director of a health company and I got really interested in the, the behavioral aspects of health and how so many, so many conditions are exacerbated by our brains failing to do decisions that we should do, you know, to make, to do the difficult things. We, you know, there's like quintessentially a failure of willpower. If anyone has ever done something that they know they shouldn't do or not done something that they know they should do, I was really intrigued by how the brain, why the brain does that. And so I just started reaching out to lots of neuroscientists and reading literature and asking all these questions. And I was always, you know, getting these emails back, like, we don't know. We don't know. 
you don't have an answer to that. We've studied cocaine in mice. That's a willpower thing. And I'm like, that's not really, not really. Yeah, so I, I wanted to apply my background really in crowdsourcing to bringing more people into the field of neuroscience so we can get closer to these questions that I personally find more interesting. And Michelle, what about yourself? I blame my children. <laughs> Very simple, I blame my children. When my, <clears throat> when my son was 18 months old, he's now almost nine, he, I was sitting at the computer one day, and I'm sitting at the computer and paying your bills online, as you do, this day and age, and my little boy comes up to me, mommy, 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 look what I found, look what I found. Yeah, yeah hang on a minute, I've just got to pay this bill. <laughs> no, no, seriously, look what I found. And I look over, and here is this little 18-year-old, little blonde hair, you know, bright blue eyes, holding out a red back spider. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> As a new mum, I'm trying really hard not to freak out. And I said, OK, uh, let's take the little spider back to where we found him, because, you know, put him back in his habitat. And how about we get the camera and take photos instead? That way we won't disturb the spider. OK. Within six months, I'd had to buy that child his own camera. <laughs> All of a sudden, I had 7,500 photos <laughs> on my computer, clogging up my computer, going, surely someone could use these. I don't even know what half of these are. So I found <clears throat> I'm a STEM professional by trade. I'm an analytical chemist. I'm part of CSIRO's STEM professionals in schools. And what that does is actually pair up a scientist or an IT professional or a mathematician with a teacher in a school in Australia. <clears throat> Which is great, except I was actually paired with five teachers, because we're very short on teachers, hint, hint, uh, very short on, on STEM professionals. But those teachers ended up being headmasters, not just classroom teachers, but headmasters, and head of curriculums, and you know, I had over two and a half thousand students all of a sudden. And I was trying to figure out something I could do with a whole school. Best way I could come up with, Quest again. Bowerbird, all these online platforms where you can take photos with an iPad, which let's face it, most kids have in schools now. And when you did that, you could actually upload it and someone could tell you what you found. My son got his first iPad for Christmas. He's had it two months. Oh, he's now ranked, I think, 900th on Question Game out of thousands. <laughs> so he's really been putting in those hard yards. The five-year-old has now asked for his iPad. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Have we got any more questions from the floor? A couple, yes. Dr. Reid. Is there a microphone coming your way? Yep. Just one moment. Getting a workout tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the funding of uh, projects associated with citizen science. As you said, there's no free lunch. It, it, you <laughs> might get the information provided to you uh, gratis, but uh, analysing and all the rest of it, uh, interpreting, takes a lot of resources. Is there a, 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 a reticence of traditional funding bodies to fund this sort of research? Do you have to go to uh, unusual places to get your funding? What's the uh, challenges? I mean, scientific funding is not easy in, in the first place, but I imagine you would suffer a little bit from them saying, oh, but that's not real science, perhaps. Uh, or, or is it really now accepted in the, in the mainstream science funding arena uh, as an as a appropriate science uh, tradition? So it really varies. I mean, there, there is our National Science Foundation, our EPA, um, NIA, National Institute of Health. They do all fund citizen science projects. Um, you know, and there's a lot of federal agencies and state agencies that run and fund citizen science projects. I mean, the real big challenge oftentimes isn't that people don't think it's going to produce good results. It's that a lot of citizen science is very long term, and it's just hard to fund a project for a really long duration. But that's often what its value is in, especially when it comes to climate change or you know, certain types of research. And so um, 
so yeah, it's often a challenge to figure out the financial models. There are some projects that charge people to participate, right? Project Feeder Watch charges $15 or so a season for the privilege of submitting data. Um, Dognition charges like 100 for doing a personality test on your dog. Like, I mean, and it's just, it's a funding, you know, it's a way to, it's kind of like mixing crowdfunding with citizen science all at once. Um, so yeah, anyway, there's just a whole spectrum of, of ways. Um, but I think the challenge is that, well, the other thing that I think happens with funding like that, uh, that I've noticed in the U.S. anyway, is that what gets funded is something that's innovative, and so it means someone reinvents the wheel. Instead of like using and sharing infrastructure that's there, which would actually be like a wiser thing, they're not going to get funding to just adapt something that already exists they'll get funded if it's something new and innovative and they have to create it from scratch again. And so in some ways that's, I think, a real problem. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I, yeah. I would say both. So for iWire, we've had philanthropists and corporations fund us. Uh, the NIH has an interesting program that's it funds games, but they're not allowed to call them games. They're called interactive digital media. <laughs> and they funded citizen science games. Uh, and then we have other funding from uh, Intel IARPA, like the intelligence arm of DARPA, for machine learning uh, and big data related uh, endeavors because we, we do a lot of AI. Um, yeah, but it, it can be very hard to fund existing projects. You know, when they are going to fund iWire, they want us to like, build iWire 2. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what about iWire 1? <laughs> it's still making science. So yeah, it's a tough one. But we've had to think outside the box. But what in, in my experience, though, they do really like the public outreach arm. And we, you know, iWire, I love design, and we do a lot of visualization work. And we've had really positive response from funders in that regard, and also on the science communication side of things. I know there were a few other hands up there earlier. Does anyone have a question from the floor? Yes, gentleman over here. I've got a micro up here, sorry. Ah, oh, right, thank you, pardon. <laughs> just give it a head, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if I could ask, once you've got data collected and pulled, what are some of the elements in making that data useful and seen as valuable to the broader society? I might throw yeah, that out go for it. <laughs> Karen first. So I think um, uh, open science and uh, and licensing data for you you know for use and reuse is a big core principle in citizen science. Um, you know, rather than it being so many people being involved in having it collected for some one person to own, like that's not how it works. Um, and so, but it's still, you know, so there's a lot of citizen science data that goes into big repositories where anyone can use them, but accessing data from a big data repository is not something that anyone can do. <laughs> like, I mean, they technically could, I mean, they could in theory, but not in practice. So, um, I mean, that's why other other good practices for citizen science projects is really to make the data in some form that is accessible for the different stakeholders, like I was sort of describing with eBird. Um, but that's also just something that's really hard to do. But I think, yeah, I think otherwise, you know, making it open in some way and accessible are like pretty core principles that, you know, that conventional science is starting to do as well, um, some fields better than others. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, we make our publications openly available, provide uh, 3D files for download of the neurons that are reconstructed in iWire so that artists can use them. We do a lot of um, public art as well and virtual reality stuff just because I'm like, these neurons are so beautiful, people need to see them. We've got to get them out there. Uh, it, it, it is tough though because, it, you know, especially in our case, we're doing fundamental research. So like, I was you know, on the phone with ABC yesterday setting up this, like, this interview thing. And they're like, so are you going to cure Alzheimer's? And I was like, no, <laughs> we're, we're, we're discovering <laughs> new types of neurons. That's pretty cool. Gamers finding new cell types. Um, but it's not going to be for, you know, 
in some cases, many decades before the actual, you know, new technology and output of, of this kind of research actually percolates into things that society sees. The machine learning, on another, on the other hand, that'll probably be something that's used in the shorter term. But that's always behind the scenes, and you know, you don't really see AI. The only AI that you see isn't like doomsday holiday movies, but it's everywhere, and it's making things better behind the scenes on all, like you know, Netflix and Google Street View, all these things. It's all AI. And I'd like to point out that you can actually cure Alzheimer's. There's actually a website for that called uh, a citizen science game as well called Stool Catchers. It's based, I think, in USA. Yeah. yeah. Originally. Cornell. Yeah. Cornell. But it's actually all it's global. Yeah. Sure. And it's actually quite fun. I am a stool catcher myself. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question from the gentleman here. Could I, so, yeah. um, could I just take one question actually further back? Um, uh, money for citizen science. Uh, I'm sure the conference organizers were aware of the uh, uh, plot of money that was put out by, I think it was Industry, Science and Innovation, the department, last year, which of course didn't appear this year. It's meant to be at least, I think, a, a three-year funding. But they were talking about lots of money for that one. Uh, that seems to disappear. On the data side, by the way, we're, we're running a citizen science program at the Bureau of Meteorology here. It's a totally self-managing enterprise. Uh, it grew up despite the Bureau uh, really wanting us there, but now we've been there for 11 years, and uh, they're beginning to see some value. One of the problems we have, of course, is that uh, a profit is never recognized in their own home. Um, our data is valued internationally, but in terms of within the Bureau, they still can't take citizen science seriously even though we've been there for quite a while. But I just had a chap come into my inbox the other day, and he's done a whole bunch of uh, river level data. And um, he literally has, has done the Burn Bidji River uh, for about a 45 year period, I think it is. And he doesn't, just doesn't have a home for that data. And that's a major problem. I have to get back to him and say, look, I can do rainfall, temperature, air pressure, but uh, you know, river levels, I don't know. So I'll have to go internationally to find out. I think that's one thing that science should really be looking at is there's a lot of people out there who are willing to contribute data in a rather disorganized fashion, <laughs> but it's going to get lost on their disk somewhere right. along the line and not captured. Yeah. A fair point there. How do you go about making sure the valuable information collected is stored and managed in an appropriate way, even if it can't be used in the immediate future? Yeah, I mean, it's a big challenge. Uh, I mean, it's great in a citizen science project where it's a set protocol and things are standardized. But yeah, um, salvaging old records like that <laughs> is super hard. And there are citizen science projects like to transcribe old records, you know, that machine learning or, you know, optical recognition software can't. Because sometimes one of people just want to digitize it really quickly. Yeah. So, um, but it is tough. But we see it, like, I mean, there was, uh, there was some key climate change papers about phenology that were based on Henry David Thoreau's journals, right, from data that he collected, which is not really any different than uh, like a lot of other people's journals that we could harness, you know, and get. But I don't, there's not a simple way to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. We, we use some of our own servers, we use Amazon Web Services, but it, it also gets expensive. For, so for example, this, we're building this new game called Neo that will come out later this year. And that game is it, it's mapping neurons in like 200,000 gigabytes worth of data. And the monthly cloud computing costs for the duration of that brand is tw for the duration of that grant, it's $21,000 a month just to host the data on Amazon. Right, so as soon as it's done, we pass it off to the government and they, they have to take care of that. But it's gonna become a, a growing issue because I mean, that's un, it's unsustainable and if it stays that expensive, you know, labs are just not gonna make their data available for, for huge image-based data sets like that. So I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> if you're talking here in Australia, the first place I'd probably be asking is your local museum. Many of them have, and, and for that matter, if it's in a book form, your local library. You never know who's going to find that interesting. If they've got it in their system, at least someone can find it. Are there any other questions from the floor? We have a question. We might start with this gentleman at the front here. Um, I have a question about public engagement, which is obviously the core of citizen science, um, specifically in relation to environmental issues and, and doing environmental research and other things through this. 
I, I think Australia has two sort of challenges that it grapples with. The first one is the fact that we are such a massive land mass with such a small population. This is very low population density. It's difficult to get concentrated groups of people doing things. We also have a cultural problem where it's hard, I think, to, in, to get people excited and get people involved with doing a lot of things that's sort of political and science-based. It's, it's very challenging. Do you have any insights from the work that you have done, the work that you've seen, especially from the United States, um, about how to, how to really you know, grab people and how to get people excited and engaged with this sort of thing? Because obviously you can't gamify everything, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> Am I going first? Yeah, that's, a, that's a question <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much from the US translates to here. I, I, I mean, I work with bird watchers, so that's like the easiest thing imaginable because they're already like organized. They already are experts. Like, I mean, they're better than I am at all the birding. They're, it's just like a super great when there's already like a group who is has a hobby that dovetails so well with what really you know with scientific activities anyway. Um, and so that's fairly easy, like in nat in natural history kinds of things. There's often those niche groups. Um, there's, uh, you know, and then it gets harder. I mean, like the microbiome stuff, like the belly button things. I mean, it, there's not groups out there with microscopes that are like interested in microbes, right? And so, like that was a big challenge. And uh, the head of that project is, you know, really big into science communication and science writing and really getting. Um, people to get excited about that, but it was hard to even just get people excited about, you know, belly buttons. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, uh, but it is, um, you know, another challenge I think with some of the citizen science projects is that they are sort of haphazard. It's like you just need people to be aware of them, so that when they happen to encounter, a, you know, a kid in a poop, they know that oh, I should collect that and send it in. Um, you know, they might not go out and do a survey. Anyway, so some of it is just raising awareness about, like, that there are these opportunities, as opposed to even just, like, particular projects. And I think that projects can really help each other leverage that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, social media, Facebook, like, there's, you know, there's just so many things that people communicate about. Um, so, I don't know. I don't... Michelle, I might throw it over to you at that point, yeah. being the social media uh, coordinator for the Australian Citizen Science Association. What's been your experience about really getting people's attention and getting them involved? It's all about the hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> Since I was 18, just remember that one. Our hashtag for this, for this particular Citizen Science um, conference has been Since I was 18. And you know that something is doing well, when people are tweeting and stuff, when the trolls come out and start trying to hijack your, actuals, your actual hashtag, it means you're making an impact. It means that people are listening. It means that it's trending on Twitter. It's trending out there in that social media universe. It means, OK, sure, you can you know, block or mute those particular trolls. But once you start getting that sort of you know, you block them, they'll, go out, they'll come out at you with another five different accounts to try and keep harassing you about it and getting your followers. But they're just adding to the message. They're just making it trend harder. And once it starts trending, I don't know if anyone here watches The Project, but they, every week they do a what's trending on Twitter. Our aim for this particular, since I was 18, is to get us on The Project. <laughs> That's my aim. Yeah. Keep an eye, eye on that hashtag citizen science, I'm just telling you. But yeah, it's all, about, it's all about the engagement and citizen science is not the only hashtag we can use. I mean, we've got astronomy, we've got mapping the brain, we've got, there's a whole heap of you know, neuroscience, astronomy. Wild Oz is actually a great one for when you're doing, um, trying to do engagement with citizen science and potential citizen science scientists out there, there is thousands and thousands of Aussies on Twitter and also on Facebook who use that wild Oz hashtag. Just have a Google, hashtag wild Oz, W-I-L-D-O-Z. You'll come up with heaps of stuff. And there's people constantly tweeting and talking about it. So it's, it's constantly in the background, always, always on the go. But if you, you hit something, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of overdoing the hashtag, because I think you can have too many. 
And some of the Instagram ones you see is just like you know, 20 different hashtags. You're like, seriously, happy? <laughs> Means what? But I, I do think that there's, I think it was Eric Qualman said, it's not how we do science, citizen science, but the fact that we have to do citizen science. It's how well we do citizen science. Well, not citizen science, but social media. And I'm, I'm just paraphrasing into the citizen science, social media paraphrasing that. Sorry. <laughs> I think there's that marketing rule of thumb that people need to hear something seven times before they really give it a try. <laughs> so, like, yeah, repetition. <laughs> repetition, repetition. <laughs> Stick with it. We had a question from a gentleman up the back there. I was just wondering if you can comment on, um, in the various projects you've done, how you acknowledge the citizen scientists and whether you give them opportunities to be involved in papers that are written um, and also what happens if um, some of the projects end up being commercialised and there's a financial um, incent or you know, financial outcome from the projects. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, there's a lot of these sort of ethical and legal dimensions to citizen science that don't get talked about that often. Um, uh, authorship kind of issues are dealt with like in a very, you know, a huge variety of ways. And there are projects that do include citizen scientists or even like large groups. <laughs> well, you guys do, we right? Do. Yeah. yeah, we list them all. Yeah, we list them all. <laughs> right. In supplementary info, we put the IYRs <laughs> and then they're ranked by their contribution. Uh -huh. It's a lot. It's like a long list. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and then other people talk about whether, I mean, I don't know how meaningful Right, so for like if you're a professional scientist, like your publication, you know, it's currency for like your career. Whereas for a citizen scientist, maybe it isn't, but it is great to have that recognition. Some prefer other forms of recognition. Like, I mean, it just really, I think, varies with the project. Um, yeah, and I have wondered, I have been looking at projects to see which ones might make, and I guess this is uh, something that's commercially viable. Is that me doing that? <laughs> um, and uh, like it could definitely become issues with, um, what is it called? Like Eterna, do you know that one? Uh, you know, ones that are designing basically different RNA and pro you know, proteins and things like that. Uh, yeah, but I haven't, seen, I haven't seen it come to a head yet, so I don't know how it'll be dealt with. But I don't think I don't know. I don't know if people read the terms of service, you know, or exactly always know what they're consenting to. So it is a big issue. I mean, it's, I think it's an issue that just really needs to be dealt with better. We, can I weigh in on this? Because we have a lot of different ways that we uh, reward our players, like besides them winning points and badges. So there's a very tight-knit community in iWire, and our top players are spending 40-plus hours a week in the game. There's, they're very dedicated, and they're, they're very much friends. And one of the players sponsors swag that goes out to everyone, so when we do competitions, they can like win shirts and mugs and stickers and posters and stuff. Um, and we did have one corporate sponsor that wanted to give cash prizes and they were based in Korea, and it was the worst thing that ever happened to iWire because the participants play for fun, and the moment that people had the opportunity to win money, they started cheating and building bots that gamed the system. Everyone became suspicious of one another. It was a really horrible scenario, but it, you know, once we got past it, it was interesting to see you know, how noble the efforts are of everybody in the community, that it works well when there's not money involved. It's pretty cool. We are going to have to start wrapping up here, but can I just ask you all, um, Michelle, perhaps starting with you, just to briefly um, tell me what you think the future of citizen science looks like? Definitely more technology. As we roll out the NBN and we, we all get better technology and technology becomes cheaper, for example, the microscope, I don't know if anyone saw that earlier today, it was on our Twitter feed, but there's a company here in Adelaide. So our, our um, T-shirts, you probably see around the place, is actually about the tools of citizen science. And one of, them, <clears throat> one of them on there is a microscope. You now get ones you can put on your phone. This one's actually created here in Adelaide. It's called 60X or 60 times, because you can go up to 60 time magnification. And it's about to be available to the public as well. And you just literally clip it onto your phone, turn it on, and you can take your phone and zoom right the way in. So we're going from macro to micro. <laughs> 
So I'm tremendously excited about the future of citizen science, and what I see is a, is a greater systematization of participation and some way that you get rewarded beyond just the realm of the project itself. So China, for example, has a really interesting kind of pilot social credit program where principally it's punishing people for like breaking rules on trains or not sorting their recycling, but they're, they're basically you're your activities in society filter back into like your credit score. So what if your participation in citizen science projects could prove that you're a better citizen, that you're responsible because you do your bird counts when you're supposed to, or you know, if the iWire team needs you to help map a neuron really quickly, you are there for them when they need you. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see that. And I also think you know, in the future, you know, we will have a greater opportunity for more people to take action on things that they're really passionate about. You know, it's unfortunate that there are so many people that are working in jobs that they just don't care about. They're working in jobs because they have to make money. And citizen science you know, has an interesting opportunity, I think, to give a sense of meaning that well aligns with what people really care about. You know, so if you don't care about science, then that's not going to apply to you, of course. <laughs> but you know, everybody as a kid has at least something that they care about and that they're interested in, so I'm excited about that as well. And Karen, you finally, the future of citizen science. I think the future of citizen science is that it becomes a household word. And yeah. it's something we don't have to like continually define and explain to people because everyone knows what it is. Everyone knows, and it's like easy to participate because everybody observes things. We all notice like when we see flowers or bugs or whatever, and it's just really having that infrastructure in place so that people can share it in the most effective, so that it is like the most valuable, um, you know, useful uh, observations possible. Ladies, thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with us tonight. There's just been so much in there to take away with us this evening. Please join me in thanking Dr. Karen Cooper, Amy Sterling and Michelle Neal. And that brings us to the end of the public lecture. Before I do let you all escape, though, we do have a lucky door prize. If I can get you all just to check down the sides of your seats, I believe, on the silver part of your seat. If there's a piece of paper uh, stuck there, you are the lucky winner of our door prize. <laughs> Don't injure yourselves in the process. <laughs> do we have a winner? Do we have a winner? If you are the winner, give us a wave. We have one winner down the front. Oh, the winner is a, it's a 60 times microscope. So that's what uh, Michelle was speaking about earlier. Congratulations. <laughs> I hope you've all enjoyed this evening. A big thank you once again to our sponsor, the South Australian Government, and of course to the Hawke Centre. Thanks again for your company this evening. My name's Jessica Harmson. Good night.